What's up, everybody? JT Sports here. Back to you guys with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. On this episode, we're going to be talking about why Mississippi State could surprise you. How good will UCLA football be? Don't sleep on Utah football for this upcoming college football season. And the Kansas City Chiefs are going to be a lot better than what many of you guys think going into the 2022 NFL season. If this is your first time listening to the JT Sports Podcast, welcome. I appreciate you for tuning in. Make sure that you follow me on all of my social media platforms. You can follow me on Twitter at JT Sports underscore underscore and on Instagram at JT Sports underscore. My Instagram page is currently deactivated. I just had to take a break from it for a couple of weeks, but it's going to be back up. Give me around July, and they'll probably be back reactivated. I just needed to take a break from social media and whatnot. And lastly, if you haven't already, make sure that you are subscribed to my YouTube channel, which is JT Sports. So I was on the Bleacher Report app. And you know on the Bleach Report app, they have community sections. And I went to the college football community section, and I asked people to give me some of their sleeper teams heading into the upcoming 2022 college football season. And there were a good amount of people who had Mississippi State on there. And I was really surprised that people would consider Mississippi State to be a sleeper team because... I love Mississippi State because I'm a big fan of Mike Leach. Mike Leach is the most entertaining coach in all of college football. The dude talks about weddings. He was just on a bar stool sports podcast that I watch. I just love listening to Mike Leach talk. If Mike Leach ever retires, I hope that he ends up going into broadcasting or they end up giving him his own podcast because anytime there's a Mike Leach interview press conference or him being featured as a guest on somebody's podcast I just watch I just love listening to Mike Leach talk and I'm a big fan of what he's done so far at Mississippi State because when he first got hired there were many people saying that he wasn't going to have that much success and I was going back and forth with those pundits they were saying that his air raid offense isn't going to last long in the SEC he never had a good defense anywhere he has went but you go into this year I can understand why so many people can view this football program as a sleeper team this year because first of all they went seven and six last year they got three wins against Texas A&M Kentucky and Auburn which I think people gave them a fair shot to beat Auburn but I don't think too many people expected them to beat Texas A&M or Kentucky Their over-under win total going into this year is 6.5. And and their out-of-conference schedule is pretty easy. You have Memphis. You have to go on the road to Arizona State, which that game could be a a toss-up in a sense because even though Mississippi State is probably the best team on paper heading into that matchup, this is an Arizona State program that has had a pretty good recruiting class. They've been really active in the transfer portal, so that could be a little bit of a trap game for the Bulldogs. Then you have Bowling Green and another school called ETSU. Don't know what that stands for. And then your conference schedule begins. Now, you should be able to go 3-0 or 4-0 in your out-of-conference, okay? Then you're going to have to be able to get a couple of big wins in your division. You're going to have to see if you can beat LSU. You have to play them on the road. You got Texas A&M. They're going to be tough. Arkansas, I think Arkansas is being heavily overlooked this year. You have to go on the road to Kentucky, Alabama. You got Auburn. You got Georgia. Then you have to travel to face your arch nemesis the old miss rebels on the road and old miss so this is a pretty tough conference schedule that mississippi state has however like last year they were able to win a couple of games that nobody expected them to win and i think they could probably do the same thing this year i don't think the gap in the sec west is as big as what people make it out to be of course you have alabama up there alabama is the cream of the crop without a doubt not denying that but other than Alabama you know you ask people who you think is going to be second place in this division behind Bama and there's a lot of answers that are all over the place so why could not why couldn't it be Mississippi State 
You have a lot of returning production coming back on offense. You have Will Rogers, who was one of the best quarterbacks statistically in college football last year. He threw for 4,739 passing yards, 36 touchdowns to nine interceptions while completing 73.9% of his passes. Your running back group is pretty good. Jacobius Marks is your all-purpose back. He can do it all. He can catch out of the backfield. He's also really good when you want to hand him the football off. You have Dylan Johnson there. Both of those guys are coming back. Your wide receiver position is probably your biggest question mark. Okay, because you lost your leading wide receiver, Makai Polk, to the NFL. But you do have Jaden Wiley, who is going to stay, who's going to probably take over that wide receiver run spot. He had 55 receptions for 628 receiving yards and six touchdowns last year. But who's going to step up after him? A couple of guys who stood out during spring that Mike Leach talked about was Antonio Harmon. He praised him for his physicality. As a matter of fact, he said that he would appreciate it. If the other wide receivers had his physicality as well. You have Rufus Harvey. Both of those guys had pretty solid springs. You got Robert Thomas there, 18 catches for 252 yards and five touchdowns last year. The wide receiver position, I'm not going to be too concerned about. I think that Mike Leach is going to be able to sprinkle a little bit of Mike Leach magic. And I think that the wide receiver position should still be pretty solid. The offensive line should be pretty good, even better than last year. Their offensive line has a good amount of talent there, a solid amount of experience. But why I'm pretty excited about this program and why so many people are looking at Mississippi State of being a sleeper in the SEC this year it's because of how def- how good this defense is. This defense is really phenomenal, okay? As a matter of fact, this may be the most talented defense that Mike Leach has ever had. Not just at Mississippi State, but in all of his years coaching, I don't think he's ever had a defense that has had not only this much talent, but this much depth. When you look at the defensive line, Nathan Pickering had four sacks last year. You got Randy Charlton, Jordan Davis there. So you have a really good amount of talent and depth there. Linebacker Tyrus Wheat had 46 tackles, seven sacks, which led the team to pass deflections and the interception. Nathaniel Watson, 83 tackles, five sacks. You got Jet Johnson. He led the team in tackles. He also had an interception, a forced fumble, and a couple of fumble recoveries. And the secondary is also pretty good as well. Somebody who really has stood out to me has been Emmanuel Forbes. He had 59 tackles, which was fourth on the team. He also had three interceptions and a couple of pass deflections. So when you look at Mississippi State, This is definitely a team that could end up surprising many people because, listen, we know what this offense is going to do. We know that this offense is still going to be really productive. They're going to put up a a lot of yards and a lot of points. Even if you do have questions about how much depth they have at wide receiver going into this year, you still should expect at least two or three guys to emerge in this passing game. I really think that Jaden Wally has the potential to become one of the best wide receivers in this conference. And overall, they're at six and a half wins, okay? We already expect them to probably pretty much go 4-0 because of how weak their out-of-conference schedule is, pending that they're able to beat Arizona State on the road, which I think that they should be able to do. And they also are capable of being able to steal a couple of games. Like I said, LSU is a team that could go either way. This is a team that could end up being just as good as Alabama, or they're a team that could be a little bit in the middle of the pack, slightly above average at eight wins. I think that that's a winnable game. I also think they have a great chance of being able to beat Texas A&M, Arkansas. The only team I don't really think that Mississippi State has a great chance at beating is Alabama and Georgia. But other than those two opponents... I think that they have a pretty good shot at being able to win the majority of their conference matchups. So if they can go ahead and get a couple of wins or they're able to steal a couple of games that they like they did last season, I don't see no reason why this team can't pop off and couldn't potentially end up winning nine games maybe. Probably eight. They went seven and six last year in year three for Mike Leach. So 
I think that Mike Leach has done a really good job with this program. I'm really excited to see what the Bulldogs are going to do. This definitely is a team that could surprise a lot of people this upcoming college football season. How good will UCLA football be in 2022? I had a friend of mine who is a Ohio State fan. He asked me, hey, JT, how do you feel about UCLA going into this season? And I said, hmm, really interesting because they're coming off their best season in 2021 with an 8-4 record. They went 6-3 and in the conference. It has been the best year that Chip Kelly has had up to this point in his coaching career with the Bruins. And there were many people who were really skeptical about Chip Kelly going into last year. I was a big defender of Chip Kelly. I said that, listen, you're going to have to give him some time. A lot of college football stole what Chip Kelly had a lot of success with. Because when Chip Kelly first became the head coach at Oregon, the kind of offense that he ran was different from what the majority of college football was doing. A lot of college football was getting underneath center, smash mouth football, relying on great defense. Chip Kelly, however, went to the no huddle approach, spread offenses. He's not going to try to beat you up the trenches. He wanted to spread you out and then gas out your defense. But he ends up coming back to an era in college football where now everybody pretty much is running the same style of offense that he was running at Oregon. So I knew that there was going to be a process, but it did pay off. UCLA did end up giving him a extension that would keep him in UCLA through 2025. And going into this year, there are many people who believe that the Bruins are probably one of the biggest sleeper teams, if not the biggest sleeper team in the Pac-12. Now, I don't believe they're the biggest sleeper team in this conference. I'm going to save that answer for another segment. You guys are going to have to subscribe if you haven't already. If you guys want to know who I think may surprise many people in the Pac-12, it's a team that not too many people are thinking of. But UCLA, I really can't consider them a sleeper simply for the fact that they have the fourth best odds to win the Pac-12 behind USC, Utah, and Oregon. And not only that, but their over-under win total for this year is eight and a half. So I can't really consider you a sleeper team if your win total is projected to be eight wins or more. I probably would pick a team that has seven wins or less, but... You have a really easy out-of-conference schedule. You play Bowling Green, Alabama State, and South Alabama. Those should be pretty three easy games that UCLA should be able to win. They did lose a good amount of talent, not only to the NFL, but to the transfer portal as well. But they've been really active this offseason when it comes to taking advantage of the portal. They are ninth currently in transfer portal rankings. Their biggest offensive losses were wide receiver Kyle Phillips, tight end Greg Dulicic. You also had him who led the team in receptions, yards, and touchdowns. He made up the majority of the passing attack along with wide receiver Kyle Phillips. So you don't really know what you're getting out of the wide receiver position this year. You do bring in Jake Bobo, transferred from Duke. He had 74 receptions, 794 receiving yards in the touchdown. We definitely can't expect him to have a really fantastic season with UCLA because if you're putting up those kind of numbers at Duke, it's no reason why you shouldn't be able to improve on that going to a team that has a better coaching staff a better quarterback situation you have Dorian Thompson Robinson who returns he had a really good year I really feel that we saw DTR mature into a very solid quarterback 2,409 passing yards completed 62.2% of his passes he had 21 touchdowns through the air to only six interceptions He ran the ball 130 times for 609 rushing yards, 4.7 yards per carry, and 9 touchdowns. I'm really excited to see what he does in 2022 this year because he took tremendous strides as a passer last year. And that's always been my biggest gripe on DTR. I understand he's a very great athlete. I know that he's really good when it comes to running with the football, but his passing has kind of been spotty at times. But last year, he definitely took a lot of great steps when it comes to improving how effective he is as a passer. And if he continues that improvement this season, 
I think he could end up being a dark horse Heisman contender. And if he ends up being a dark horse Heisman contender, there's no reason why you shouldn't expect UCLA to be able to compete with the Utahs and the USC's of the world. You also bring back running back Zach Charbonnet who had 202 carries for 1,137 rushing yards, 13 touchdowns, while averaging 5.6 yards per carry. And he's probably going to end up having a bigger role this year with the departure of running back Britton Brown, who also left for the NFL draft. And when you go back to the wide receiver position, outside of Jake Bobo, who else do you have? You have Kazmir Allen, who pretty much has been a returner, but he also has had some pretty... Big flashy moments as well when he's came in as a wide receiver. Last year, he had four touchdown grabs for 17 receptions and 255 receiving yards. Cam Brown had two touchdown receptions, 17 catches for 247 receiving yards. Also, Josiah Norwood also is probably going to be in that mix to be one of your starting slot receivers this year. Your offensive line should be pretty good. UCLA, when I was looking at their roster and their depth chart, they don't have too many underclassmen when it comes to their offensive line. And that's a good thing and a bad thing because at least for this year, you know that your offensive line is going to have tons of experience. I think the only person who is in the upperclassmen who's going to be starting is at right tackle. I think he's a redshirt freshman. So the bad thing about that is that you're going to be losing a lot of pieces on that offensive line going into 2023, but we'll worry about that another time. If you're watching this video, you only care about what you're going to do this season. And the big thing for UCLA, and I think this is what's going to make or break UCLA in terms of if they're going to be able to compete with USC and Utah, is going to be their defense. And their defense is probably the biggest question mark because you bring in a new defensive coordinator and Bill McGovern, Fans finally had their wishes granted. The previous defensive coordinator, it seemed as if Chip Kelly didn't want to let him go. It, it seemed as if he was forced to let him go. I guess they had a really good friendship. He didn't want to fire him or anything like that. But UCLA finally pulled the plug and said, hey, Chip, you got to let him go. I know you love him, but please let him go. And I think he ended up just stepping down and resigning pretty much. So I'm excited to see what McGovern does with this defense because this was a defense last year that dramatically underperformed because I was going again to last year thinking that UCLA was going to have one of the best defenses in all of college football. Not only just in all of college football, but I was thinking that they were going to have the best defense in the Pac-12 and that didn't happen. And not only that, but they had tons of talent on the defensive side of the football. And they lost a good amount of players to the league and also to the transfer portal. But a couple of key players on this side of the football that I am really excited to watch. You have linebacker Darius Musau. It's always fun trying to pronounce those Hawaiian names, isn't it? But you have him, he's a transfer from Hawaii, 65 tackles, 7 sacks, 5 forced fumbles, and their interception. This guy is a monster. He's all over the place. He reminds me a lot of Jehalani Tavai. And if you aren't a diehard Pac-12 fan or you don't follow Hawaii football that much, you probably don't remember who Jihalani Tavai was, but he was a monster when he was coming out of the draft out of Hawaii a couple of years ago. He got drafted by Detroit, but ever since then, he kind of has faded out in the NFL, but he reminds me a lot of him. You also have pass rushers that you got in a bundle deal. They're transfers from North Texas. Gabriel Murphy and Grayson Murphy. Murphy's, they combine for a monster sack total combined. Gabriel had seven and a half sacks last year. Grayson had eight and a half sacks. Also, you bring those two in on defense. Your pass rush to still be really good, if not better than what it was last year. Bo Calvert had 38 tackles, four sacks. You also have cornerback Devin Kirkwood, 
who I'm really excited about. He was a four-star recruit coming out of the 2021 recruiting cycle. He's 6'3", 194 pounds. He has great length and phenomenal short area quickness. And you don't really see a cornerback that's this kind of lengthy who moves this well. Normally, when you see this kind of corner, you're assuming he's just a press man-to-man corner. And he doesn't really move all that well. Well, Devin Cook were Cook. Kirkwood is completely different as a matter of fact he also could play safety as well so you have a lot of versatility with him and the few games that he appeared in last season he had 15 tackles he recorded a forced fumble and had an interception as well I think he could end up being a breakout player this year for the Bruins defense so overall when you look at UCLA I mean for Chip Kelly I think that this is a big opportunity for him because I think that UCLA has a very good shot of being able to win the Pac-12 this year. Not only that, but if Chip Kelly can end up winning a game against either Utah or USC this year, that's going to be really big for him. And I understand that UCLA beat USC last year, but you got to understand all the hype that USC has this year of Lincoln Riley as the new head coach, everybody that they've gotten in the transfer portal, Mario Addison, you got Caleb Williams, USC is stacked. Everybody seems as if USC is going to end up making it into the college football playoff this year. So imagine if Chip Kelly could end up getting a win against Lincoln Riley. Imagine how much that would change the perception of Chip Kelly. Because believe it or not, I still think there are a lot of pundits out there against Chip Kelly that feel that last season was kind of a little bit of a fluke. However, if you can be a USC or even Utah, I think that's going to change the perception about Chip Kelly a lot. So I think that this is a really big year for Chip Kelly to really come and cement himself. And hey, you know, USC, USC, yes, they've had all these acquisitions. They brought in Lincoln Riley and whatnot. Utah is also going to be there as well. But USC, as good as what they are, they still have to worry about UCLA football. And with UCLA football kind of looking as if it's on the rise, I think that this is a team that many people might be overlooking. And if you're somebody who likes to bet the over-under, you get what I'm saying? I try to leave that alone. I'm not really the legal gambling age anyway, but don't tell nobody. But I definitely feel that UCLA definitely probably would be A really solid bet. I definitely could see them winning over nine games this year. I don't think their schedule is too difficult. As I mentioned, their out-of-conference schedule isn't all that tough. And I definitely feel that they can end up pulling off an upset against either Utah or USC this year. So... You guys, let me know if you're watching this on YouTube how good you guys feel the UCLA Bruins football program is going to be in 2022. Because last year, after they defeated LSU, I came out and said that I feel UCLA was going to have a pretty solid year. I didn't say they were going to end up being the best team in college football or whatnot. But I was thinking that they probably could end up being around eight wins. Maybe they could push in the nine This year, I definitely feel it is a realistic expectation to see this team winning nine or heck, even 10 games because for USC, they have some problems that not too many people are bringing up. You know, we still have questions about how good the defense is going to be primarily when it comes to that front seven. USC still has to work on some things when it comes to their offensive line. You're looking at UCLA, they're a better team up front than USC. And when you look at the Pac-12 teams that have had the most problems in the past that end up having these high expectations but end up not being able to deliver on them, they mainly stem from getting beat up in the trenches. And for UCLA, Chip Kelly has kind of changed his offensive mentality in a sense because now it seems as if he puts a lot more emphasis on being able to physically dominate you up front. 
And when you look at some of the more successful Pac-12 teams in the past, such as Utah last year, one common characteristic is that they've always have been super dominant in the trenches. So if UCLA is really good up front this year, there's no reason why this team couldn't end up shocking many people and end up being able to win the Pac-12. Now, they're not my biggest sleeper team for this conference. I don't really consider them a sleeper team because, as I mentioned, eight and a half win total. Many people think that they have a legitimate shot to win this conference this year. Can't really pick them as a sleeper team, but I definitely have a team that will fit that role perfectly. But you guys got to subscribe to the channel if you guys want to find out who that is or check out the JT Sports Podcast that's available on every single podcasting platform, wherever you get your podcasts from. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, it's out everywhere. All you got to do is type in the JT Sports Podcast, subscribe to the feed, leave a five-star review. It's simple. If you guys want to figure out who my biggest sleeper team is in the Pac-12 this year. So we're going to stay in the Pac-12, right? Just because I feel like showing the Pac-12 some love on this episode. Don't sleep on Utah football, man. I think many people are overlooking the use this season. People are looking over Utah because USC, they hired Lincoln Riley, bring in all of these fantastic players from the transfer portal. So I can understand why some people have kind of forgot about Utah a little bit. But it's kind of disrespectful how people are overlooking the Utes. And it's funny because... You remember last season, people were just so quick to crown Oregon the Pac-12 champions, right? And we thought that 2021 was finally going to be the year that the Ducks make it back into the college football playoffs. But guess who was that team who ruined that party for the Ducks? Utah. Not only did they dominate Oregon once, but they did it twice in the regular season, in the Pac-12 championship game. And you let me remind you, this was a team that didn't come out a guns blazing. As a matter of fact, they started out one and two. They had losses on the road to BYU and San Diego State. But after those minor setbacks, they made a quarterback change. I believe Charlie Brewer was the starting quarterback to start the year. And then you brought in Cam Rising. And in the West was history, they went nine and one after that one and two start before losing to the Buckeyes in the Rose Bowl 48 to 45 and one of the greatest college football games that I've seen in my lifetime. And I I don't want to hear none from you old heads talking about something. Man, you think that's one of the greatest college football games? Listen, I'm only 20. You get what I'm saying? So I'm not 40 or 50 years old, so I can't remember the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s or anything like that. So when I say of my lifetime, I'm not speaking for all time. You get what I'm saying? But look at the Utes, man. This team is better than USC. And I expect them to beat USC this year and win this conference. Because one thing about these Pac-12 teams that a lot of people fail to realize is that, yes, they look really good on paper, but anytime they face a team that's overly dominant in the trenches, they get pulverized. And Utah is that team. They were that team last year. They may not have had the big household names that Oregon had, but they had guys who were really phenomenal up front. And this is a team that doesn't do anything flashy. They're not going to beat you throwing the football 50, 40 times a game. They want to run the football down your throat, and they want to impose the world on you up front. You have running back Tavion Thomas, who was one of the best running backs in college football, in my opinion. He had 1,108 rushing yards on 204 attempts, 21 touchdowns, averaged 5.4 yards per carry. I'm really excited about him, man. I wouldn't be surprised if we end up seeing him go for almost 2,000 yards this year because TJ Pledger now is gone. He's in the NFL now. So, I think Tavion Thomas could end up having a bigger workload. Your offensive line, without a doubt, is the best in the Pac-12. Not only is it the best in this conference, but it's also one of the best old lines in all of college football. Okay, you have a really good group of tight ends. You have Brent Keithy, who is one of the more athletic tight ends that we have in college football. I mean, this guy can move. This isn't your typical tight end. 
you don't really see tight ends who are this good after the catch that Brent Keithy is, but this is a really phenomenal tight end when it comes to making things happen after the catch. You also have Dalton Kincaid. And these two tight ends made up the majority of the passing attack for the Utes last year. Keithy had 50 receptions for 611 receiving yards, 6 touchdowns. Kincaid had 36 receptions, 510 yards, and 8 touchdowns as well. The wide receiver core is also pretty good as well. But they have a phenomenal defense. And remind you, this is a team that returns 17 starters from last year. I do have questions about who's going to be replacing linebacker Devin Lloyd and Sewell, but you do have defensive tackle Junior Tafuna, who ended up winning Pac-12 freshman defensive player of the year. He is one of the best D tackles in the Pac-12. He had four and a half sacks, 33 tackles last year. And it's funny that he won the award because you can make the argument and say that Cole Bishop also could have won that award as well because he stepped up big as a freshman in 2021. 54 tackles, three sacks, and five pass deflections. Also in the secondary, you have cornerback Clark Phillips, who is one of the best cornerbacks in college football going into this season. 13 pass deflections. He had two interceptions. You got safety Vontae Davis. So this is a really good defense, and you are going to have to figure out who's going to replace Sewell, Devin Lloyd, you don't know how great the linebacker play is going to be replacing those guys you also did lose your leading pass rusher but overall man this is a Utah team that I think too many people are expecting it's just going to lay down and lose to USC like last year when people thought this was just Oregon's conference to lose and everybody seemingly counted out Utah but you look at the struggles that USC currently has in the roster right now. Everybody looks at the addition of Williams, Mario Addison, and everybody that they added from the transfer portal, but the offensive line still is a huge question mark, and we don't really know how good their front seven is going to be also. So for Utah, with a team that takes personal pride in embarrassing teams that seem to be better than them, in a sense... They take pride in not only beating them, but embarrassing them. If you go back and you watch that Oregon game, I was just saying, wow, man, they, they, they're beating this team twice. And not just beating them, but they're just physically imposing their will. They're just dominating Oregon. And it's one thing to beat a team, but to dominate a team, just running the football, ground and pound, that's just outright disrespectful, man. Just outright disrespectful. Not only that, but... Kyle Winningham, man, coming off one of the best seasons ever that he's been the head coach in Utah. He won Pac-12, Coach of the Year. I mean, the dude is phenomenal. And not too many people list him as one of the best coaches in college football. So if you're a Utah fan or a non-Utah fan and you're watching this video, you know, where do you rank Kyle Winningham in terms of the college football coaching hierarchy, do you consider him to be a top 20 coach, top 15, top 10 coach? I know he hasn't won a national championship or appeared in the college football playoff yet, but Utah has gotten really close over the year to breaking over that mold. And if there's going to be a Pac-12 team to get into the playoffs this year, it, my bet is going to be on Utah, really, because... When you look at some of the more successful Pac-12 teams over the last couple of years, they've all been really good up front. And it hasn't really been about who your quarterback is and how flashy of a skill position group you have. It's really been about which Pac-12 teams can handle themselves up front. And for Utah, that definitely is that team. On top of that, you know, they had a bunch of underclassmen last year who really stepped up and played major roles. So for this team to have the kind of season that they did last year was kind of remarkable. You're not going to see it too often. And going into 2022, man, I feel too many people are just quick to give this conference to USC like they was with Oregon. And we saw last year went, and I wouldn't be surprised if we end up seeing Utah smack USC the same way they did Oregon last year. Even though USC is a better program than what Oregon was last season, they are more talented. However, we don't know how good the Trojans are going to be on the line of scrimmage. And if you want to be able to beat this Utah team, you got to be able to hold up up front. And I don't think USC is going to be able to do a good job of that this year. And when you look at 
Utah's schedule is not overly difficult. You're opening the season going on the road to Gainesville. Billy Napier's first ever game as a head coach for Florida, which it's not going to be an easy game for Utah. You know, it could be a game that Utah wins by at least one possession, a field goal, or a late touchdown because it's week one of the college football season. You know, teams kind of come out a little bit rusty, and that is the best chance for upsets. The majority of upsets that occur in college football, they happen really early in the season because you still have teams that they're trying to get back into the flow of things. So, that Florida game, week one, do not overlook it. I wouldn't chalk it up as an automatic victory, even though I'm hoping that Utah ends up winning that game. I wouldn't be surprised if Florida won that matchup. Then you have to play UCLA, Oregon, Washington State on the road. You do have the luxury of being able to play USC and Stanford at home this year. So overall, this is a Utah football team, man, that, like I said earlier, they're my pick to win the Pac-12 this year. I think too many people are just so quick to ride on the USC hype train, and I understand why people are hopping on the Trojans hype train this year. And I'm not talking about the condoms, neither. I think that for Utah, they're just so better up front than what USC right now is. I don't think that USC is going to be able to match the physicality that Utah brings because Utah is a really physical football team, man. They they really wear you down over the course of a game, man. And it's really hard to beat them because once you get into the fourth quarter, they've already... You know, tired you out so much that you're tired, you're kind of gassed. So not only do you have to be really good up front, but you also have to have really good depth up front as well. You have to be able to be able to rotate guys in and keep guys fresh going into the fourth quarter, man. Because even though Utah's offense isn't that unpredictable, you know that this is a team that wants to establish the ground game. And you understand what they want to do. But it's it's more demoralizing to know when something is coming and still not being able to stop it, that just shows you that that team is just outright dominant and they're outright better than you. And if any team is going to have a chance of being able to slow down Utah in this conference, you're going to have to be able to hold up up front. So let me know how you guys are feeling about the Utes going into the 2022 college football season down in the comment section down below if you're watching this on YouTube. The last thing I want to talk about, the Kansas City Chiefs, we know they lost Tyreek Hill, they lost on board in free agency, one of their best cornerbacks on their team to the San Francisco 49ers, you lost Honey Badger, and I think that this is still my pick to win the AFC West this year. I'm not going to sit and lock it in stone, but I think too many people are overlooking Kansas City. There's even a couple of people out there that think that the Chiefs are going to miss the playoffs this year. And it it's really funny, man, because I give this lecture almost every year and almost every single segment I have to end up going on this rant and giving people this lecture. But too many people judge teams based off talent. I don't know if a lot of you guys realize this, but think about it. Does the best team win the Super Bowl every year? No. Let's be honest. If you were going to tell me that the New York Giants were going to beat the Patriots on paper, many people would have said that you were crazy. I'm just saying the best team does not always win the Super Bowl every year. And you want to know the reason for that? It's because of coaching. That's what people seem to overlook when it comes to making these record predictions in the offseason, a lot of people make their predictions based off the talent that a team has, and they don't take coaching into account. That's why I was right about the Steelers and the Patriots both making it into the playoffs last year when a lot of people were counting them out. That's because a lot of people didn't give props to Bill Belichick and Mike Tomlin's ability to elevate those rosters. When you have an elite head coach, they are able to elevate the talent that they have on their squads. And for Kansas City... It's not as if they just went from being the best team into the NFL to being one of the worst teams in the NFL. I mean, yes, losing Tyreek Hill is a big loss because Tyreek Hill by himself is good enough to win you three, four games. You get what I'm saying? His impact to affect the game, not only 
as a wide receiver, but in the return game as well, is special. That's definitely a big loss. But you have Andy Reid, and you have Patrick Mahomes, and that's really all you need. You have a lead quarterback, and you have one of the best coaches in this game. So for Kansas City alone, just having Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes, they should already be included in your playoff prediction. Then on top of that, you still have one of the best off the lines in the NFL. You have off the tackles, Orlando Brown. You got Andrew Wiley. You have off the guards, Joe Thune, Trey Smith, Center Creed, Humphrey. So this is a top five, no worse than top 10 offensive line. You get what I'm saying? You look at the wide receiver position. Yes, you don't have a Tyreek Hill, but you do have a good amount of players who can step up and have big roles in this offense. I think Miko Hartman could finally have a breakout year this season. And the thing with Miko Hartman isn't that he's trash or anything like that. He's a pretty solid player. The thing is, is that he doesn't get the same amount of volume as a Tyreek Hill or a Travis Kelsey does. So if he can get about 80, 90 targets this year, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him end up being a pro bowler. You also have Juju Smith-Schuster. And I know that Juju Smith-Schuster, he's one of the, he's one of those players that you either, you hate him or you love him. As a Steeler fan, I love Juju. I'm, I was a little bit hurt when it came to my realization that he was going to end up leaving the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I understand the TikTok thing rubs people the wrong way, but if you look at Juju on the field, he's one of the best slot receivers in the game. He's a good blocker. He's really dependable in third down situations. I'm going to miss Juju in a Steelers uniform. You also have Marquez Valdez-Scantling, who I think could end up being a really good deep threat. You got rookie Sky Moore, Justin Ross. If you guys haven't seen my Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver on preview or who I think is going to end up stepping up for the Chiefs at receiver, receiver this year make sure that you guys go ahead and check that out but I think that Justin Ross is going to end up starting over MVS at one of those starting outside wide receiver spots you also do have Josh Gordon in there he's somebody who Andy Reid loves a lot so this offense still should be really good you got Travis Kelsey there who is probably going to be your most reliable weapon in the passing game running back is a really interesting situation and it's not a bad one, but you do have Clyde edwards Lair, who kind of looks to be a bust at this point. He has kind of struggled to stay on the field. When he's on the field, he's okay, but not as dominant as what you would expect out of a first-round pick at running back. You bring in Ronald Jones. I'm interested in seeing how he's going to impact this offense. You still have Jared McKinnon there. So the offense, you shouldn't be too worried about. Even with the loss of Tyreek Hill, this is still going to be a top-10 offense statistically just because you have Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes there and you do have one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. On defense, many people are probably going to ask, JT, where's the pass rush coming from? Because the pass rush kind of has been something that Kansas City hasn't really had over the last couple of years. You still have Chris Jones there. We know about him. He led the team in sacks with nine. You got Frank Clark, who had four and a half sacks. Then you have Mike Dana. You have Nanadi, who both com- who both had three sacks each. Then you drafted rookie George Karloff, this out of Purdue. And many people felt that he was a big steal for Kansas City. I'm really intrigued in seeing what he does in his rookie year. Some people believe that he can end up winning defensive rookie of the year this season. We're going to have to see. But I was a big fan of Carl Loftus. This is somebody who was an extremely hard worker at Purdue. When you listen to some of those Boilermaker coaches talk about him, they loved his work ethic. He was a great leader. This is somebody who gave it his all on every single snap. Never had to worry about him taking a snap off or a playoff. I love George Karloff. I'm excited to see what he's going to do this season in the Chiefs uniform. At linebacker, you're pretty solid there. You got Willie Gay, Nick Bolton. Cornerback is probably another grievance that many people have when it comes to Kansas City. You got Lejarius Sneed there, who is their best corner at the moment. You have Rashard Fenton there. Uh, 
I don't know, but you do have star cornerback Trick McDuffie, who many people loved when he was coming out of this past year's NFL draft out of Washington. I'm a big fan of his, and if he ends up playing in that slot position, I think he could immediately end up being one of the best slot cornerbacks in the league, and he could kind of have a similar rookie season to what Nate Hobbs had with the Las Vegas Raiders last year, and if you're a Chiefs fan, you probably should know who Nate Hobbs is, because, I mean, let's not act like we don't pay attention to the rest of the division if you are a Chiefs fan so Nate Hobbs was the best slot cornerback in the NFL when it comes to rookies there weren't too many good rookie slot cornerbacks that had the kind of season that Nate Hobbs had so at safety he lost Honey Badger but you replace him with Justin Reed he's younger kind of underrated I feel last season for Houston may have been his worst year yet as a pro, but he's been pretty solid. You do have Juan Thornhill there. He's also pretty good. So for Kansas City, man, don't sleep on them. And remember, I was the same person who came up on here last year when everybody was riding off Kansas City when they got off to their slow start. And you can still watch it. I don't have too many shorts up on the channel, but I told people, do not sleep on Kansas City. There were so many people who were quick to count out Kansas City when they just had a couple of weeks when they struggled. But that was just the first few weeks of the NFL season. I tell everybody, you have to... Judge teams based off what they do come the month of November because that's when teams start to separate themselves. I look at Kansas City, and I think Kansas City offensively could maybe be better without Tyreek Hill because there were a lot of instances where Patrick Mahomes would just force Tyreek Hill the ball downfield just to throw him the football. So with him being gone out the mix, you're going to have other wide receivers who can get involved and have an impact in this offense. So yes, Tyreek Hill is a loss. You definitely are going to miss that. You probably are going to have to be a little bit more creative. You're going to have to work a little bit harder on offense if you're Airbnb or Andy Reid, whoever the heck they have calling plays. But overall, I think the Kansas City Chiefs are going to be a lot better than what people think. I, I'm going to have a hard time seeing Kansas City win less than 11 games. 11 games is how low I'm willing to go with the Chiefs. And if you say 10, I can understand that. If the Chargers and Broncos end up being as good as advertised, then yes, Kansas City probably could end up winning 10 games. But anything less than 10 wins... And then the single digits, I think, is extremely pushing it. And I'm not willing to go no less than 11. You probably could argue that they could win 10. And maybe you could get me the budge a little bit. But single digit wins for Kansas City this year, uh uh, not happening. Just because you lose Tyreek Hill, you still have other great pieces in place that have success. So. The Kansas City Chiefs are going to be better than what a lot of people think this year. I think a lot of people are thinking that this is going to be a team that's going to struggle. They're going to be a little bit up and down. And when Kansas City ends up being a well-oiled machine and they end up winning, you know, 12 games this year and they're still in the running for one of the top spots in the AFC come playoff time, I'm going to come right back on here and I'm going to say I told you so. You see, there are so many people who are quick to want to count out successful franchises just because they're tired of seeing them at the top and last year was a perfect example of that the moment Kansas City struggled out the gate many people took that opportunity to say this was the end of the Kansas City Chiefs dynasty this is the end JT and look what happened you get what I'm saying one thing that I'm never going to do is count out a team that has a great head coach and I'm not counting out the Patriots this year I'm not going to count out the Pittsburgh Steelers and the only reason why not having a great coach isn't a guaranteed lock for you performing better than expectations. It's only if you're in the situation that Mike Tomlin is and you have a lot of other good coaches in your division or same thing with Bill Belichick. You know, you look at the Patriots, the reason why they could do more of less and just rely on their coaching was simply for the fact that the AFC East at the time didn't have any good coaches. Then Sean McDermott comes in and then the Buffalo Bills end up succeeding the Patriots when it comes to a talent standpoint and they end up being the most talented team in that division. Then on top of that, you already have more talent than New England and you had a coaching staff led by Sean McDermott that was one of the best in the league and that's when the Buffalo Bills started to overtake New England so unless you have Brandon Staley Nathaniel Hackett or Josh McDaniels that just come out this year and show me that they are elite coaches or really good coaches and they are able to make adjustments 
and they can coach up to the level of uh, Andy Reid and the coaches that he also has on his staff, you're not going to understand that. But at the moment, I still think that Kansas City should be the favorite to win this division. But I appreciate you guys for listening to this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. Make sure that you guys like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're listening to this on YouTube. Remember that this podcast is out on every single podcasting platform, Spotify Podcast, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast from, the JT Sports Podcast is available. And I appreciate you guys for listening to this episode.